Well, I would invite you to turn to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, beginning the fourth chapter this morning. And our focus will be on John 4, verses 1 to 14. songs coming into this passage as we sang this morning about sending the light that's what we're going to be looking at this morning coming into John 4 we're going to be looking at evangelism in the perspective of our Lord John chapter 4 verses 1 to 14 the word of the living God reads now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. <coughs> Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. May God bless the reading of his word. If you would bow with me, Lord God, I'm so thankful for the privilege to be here this morning. Lord, I'm thankful that... You have brought this day to pass that we may glory in your name, that we may glory in who you are. Lord, you are eternal. You stand above time and you have foreordained the end from the beginning. Lord, I'm so thankful that you have ordained this day to come to pass and have made it come to pass. That your name would be proclaimed. That your word would be delighted in amongst your saints and that your word would build up your saints. Lord, that's my prayer this morning. That us as your people, whom your marvelous light has shown into, call forth out of darkness into light. It's my prayer that your word would do a mighty work in us this morning. That it would give us a greater confidence in you and a greater understanding of how we are to serve you. And we would see the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here beginning in John chapter 4, as we just read, we are introduced to this dialogue between Jesus and this Samaritan woman, or as many have said, the woman at the well. This passage concerning this woman extends to verse 42 of chapter 4, and we'll be making our way through it in the next coming weeks. And this is such a great passage for us, as I mentioned earlier before we read it, because it's about evangelism. It's such a great passage for us because here we see Jesus our Lord exemplifying for us intentional evangelism, intentionally going out of your way to speak to someone the truth concerning who Jesus is, intentional evangelism. Now, we absolutely just got through seeing Jesus evangelize Nicodemus, but it's a little different here. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night claiming what he thought he knew about him only to then be corrected by Jesus and shown that he really didn't know what he thought he knew. Jesus corrected him. 
For you cannot truly know the person of Christ unless you be born again. You cannot truly know anything rightly unless you humbly submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. I can't know anything rightly unless I'm looking at it through the lens of the one who has created it. Jesus Christ has created all things. All things have been made through him. And without him has not anything been made that has been made. Christ is the one who has descended from heaven and has revealed truth to us. Truth is not found in anywhere but him. So in John 3, Jesus rightly corrects this man, Nicodemus. And through his correction, he evangelizes him. He, he tells him who he is and that he must submit to him for truth. That salvation and all truth come from him and him alone. He evangelizes Nicodemus. And praise God for those opportunities that we get like that when someone comes to us speaking about spiritual things and we just simply get to correct them or give them the truth. We get to evangelize them because they came to us. Praise God for those opportunities when a door wide open comes to us to share the truth of the gospel. Those are great opportunities, aren't they? Amen. Praise God for those opportunities. Because if we're truly honest with ourselves, those opportunities don't really just come up all the time. Those opportunities don't just come up a lot. Now, maybe they did 10, 20, 30 years ago when, when the culture here in America was still somewhat Christianized or, shall I say, moralized at least, but believed in a God. But in the culture we live in today, it's very rare that someone is just going to ask you out of the blue about God. It's very rare that someone's just going to ask you out of the blue about spiritual things or even speak of God. We, we live in a postmodern culture where most people believe that truth is subjective. That what is true for me may not be true for you. Uh, if I am, I know that I'm born with the biological features of a man, but if I want to say that I'm a woman, then I'm a woman, and you must accept that because that's true for me. That's the culture that we live in today. If two plus two is seven to me, then it's seven, and you're just going to have to deal with it. And if you don't, you're you're a bigoted. You're you're a hater. You're uh, you're in judgment over me. That's that's just the culture we live in today. And. So we, we live in this culture and they say that you shouldn't talk about religion because you shouldn't impose your worldview on someone else. You shouldn't make someone, uh, you shouldn't try to make someone believe what you believe. Let them believe what they believe as long as they're not hurting someone. You can quickly see the foolishness of such a statement. You can quickly see the contradictory nature of such a statement by the fact that someone who would say such a thing, that you shouldn't impose your worldview on someone else, Someone who would say such a thing is, is doing the very same thing that they're saying that you shouldn't do. They're seeking to impose a worldview on you. They're, they have a worldview that you shouldn't impose other worldviews on, and they're saying, hey, you shouldn't do that. You should believe like me. That, that's the foolishness of rejecting God. That's the contradictory nature of reject, rejecting truth and rejecting God. You, you're, you're doing things while contradicting the exact same things that are coming out of your mouth. But as we live in a culture that is brought up and indoctrinated that way, People's consciences are then more and more susceptible to being tolerant of lies and tolerant of inconsistencies. They just don't see it. They're brought up that way, and that's how they think it should go. They don't see the inconsistencies. And as that happens, the standard of morality decreases, and then you see what is happening in our country and what has happened in many other countries as, as well. So where it may have been common and culturally acceptable to have conversations about God at one point where people would more bring this up to you and you could share the truth to them as they bring that up. Uh, that's no longer the case. Now you're just supposed to let someone believe what they believe and as long as they don't hurt you, then we're good. Well, are we? Can, is someone in a good position regardless of what they believe even though they, they don't physically hurt someone? Is someone in a good position no matter what they believe? As long as they don't do anything to hurt people. Because the truth himself tells me that if you don't entrust yourself to the Son, you're going to perish. If you don't obey him, then the wrath of God is upon you. The holy hatred of God upon rebels to him, sinners to him, is upon you at this very moment. So what should I believe? Should I believe the culture that tells me that I should leave someone alone with their convictions as long as they don't hurt anyone? Or should I believe my Lord who says that regardless of their quote-unquote good actions, they will face the wrath and justice of God apart from entrusting themselves to the Son? Who, who should I believe here? How do I measure what is true? Well, it, it must be from the one who reveals truth to us, right? It, it must be from the Son who is the creator of all things and reveals to us what is true. 
I'm not to accept what a deceived culture who follows the own desires of their dead spiritual hearts would say. I'm to follow what my creator says. Because when it comes down to it, you can be the citizen of the year. But if you haven't entrusted yourself to Christ, the Bible says you're going to hell. That's, that's your end spot. You will face the just justice of God for your rebellion against him. Regardless of what quote-unquote good things you've done, the Bible says our good deeds are like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. You will face the justice of God. Church, there's no such thing as a good person. We, we have to look at these things from a biblical worldview, not from what the culture tries to indoctrinate us with. There's no such thing as a good person. No one is good, no, not one. No one is good but God. No one is perfectly good, perfectly righteous, never done anything wrong in their life but God. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of his glory. And apart from being born again in faith in Christ, every person in this world is quote-unquote good as they may seem on the outside, is a hater of God, is a, a rebel to God, because they love and follow and they exalt the opinions of the creation over the truth of their creator. They, they exalt the opinions of the creation over the truth of their creator. And though there may be unbelievers out there who wouldn't hurt a soul, I know there are, and hold to a very similar morality of a life that even a Christian would. They are still slapping God in the face by seeking to live their life by his standards, but not giving him the glory for it. They're thieves. They said, well, I'll take your morality and I'll live that way because I want to, not because you say. I will not give you the glory, God. I'll do it because I want to. I'll do it because I can be good without you. You don't even have a definition for good, what good is without God, church. He is the one who tells us what good is. And they're thieves. They're morality thieves. And they are hurting people all over this world with their false ideologies and lies that send people to hell and destruction every day. So where we have a world that says, let someone believe what they believe, and as long as they don't hurt you, then we're good. We have a Lord that says, we have a creator that says, go into all creation and preach the gospel everywhere. Go into all creation, preach the truth of salvation, of forgiveness of sins, of justification and righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, who there is salvation in no one else. Go preach that to all the world. Don't, don't just let them believe what they want to believe. Now, now, there does come a time when uh, you should just wipe the dust off your shoulder and you're just casting your pearls before swine. But you should just lead people in lies. You, you should attempt to give someone the truth. They're in a burning building and they don't even know it. And we should seek to take them out. We have a Lord that tells us to go proclaim the gospel to all creation. Which means we haven't been called to just wait around for people to ask us about God. We've been called to actually intentionally engage them. I haven't been called to just wait for them to come to me. I've been called to go to them and tell them. I've been called to intentionally evangelize. Because for the most part, sinners who internally hate God and rebel against him are not just going to up and ask us to tell them about him. I'm going to have to go engage them. I'm going to have to dive into their world instead of them coming to mine. And as we have seen John the Baptist and his disciples intentionally evangelize and, and point people to Christ, here we see our Lord exemplify this through his interaction with this Samaritan woman at the well. So as we make our way through this passage, we'll be looking at it from a, a very evangelistic pers perspective, but we'll also continue to see John's very own intention for this gospel as well, as we continue to see the greatness of the Son of God, whom we ourselves should believe in and continue to believe in and entrust ourselves to. And to begin this passage, we see Jesus leaving Judea and departing again for Galilee. Now the reason at hand for him leaving that we're given was his learning of the Pharisees coming to the knowledge of his ministry. And if you remember, they kept a very close watch of John the Baptist's ministry, and it would seem to maybe avoid unnecessary conflict, especially with John the, uh, John the Baptist's disciples being bitter over him. Uh, we saw that uh, in the last part of John chapter 3. They were bitter over everyone going to him and, and being baptized by him. So to avoid unnecessary conflict, it seems that he leaves for Galilee. But just because that is the reason given, that doesn't mean that there isn't a divine plan in all of this. It doesn't mean that... that it, there isn't a, a plan from God in all of this. Because 
Jesus has come down to accomplish the will of the Father. And Jesus will only do that which the Father wills for him to do. And when verse 4 clearly states that he had to pass through Samaria. He had to. Well, he didn't necessarily have to pass through Samaria to get to Galilee. There were other ways that you could get to Galilee that weren't through Samaria. Now, given this route to Galilee through Samaria from Judea was the normal and shortest route followed by Jewish travelers in Jesus' day. But that doesn't mean that he had to go through Samaria. There were alternative ways. But those ways were definitely not as comfortable and they were longer. Um, and there are some who try to say that because of the great animo animosity that existed between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people of that day, that most Jews would not travel this way through Samaria to Galilee. But historically, from what you see in historical writings, that isn't backed up. This, this was the most normal route uh, to get to uh, Galilee from Judea. You would go through Samaria. This was the most normal and shortest route to Galilee, taken by Jews or taken by anyone, really. But that's not why he had to take it. He had to take it because there's a woman there in Samaria that he set his heart on to save. Amen. There's a woman there that he's planned from all eternity to meet at this well, and he's going to deliver her the truth. And when God sets his heart to save someone, church, he's coming after them. Amen. He has to go that way because when he sets his heart and love to save someone, he's coming after them. He's going to them. It doesn't matter where they are. God comes after his people. And the only way that his people are getting saved is through the gospel, through the truth concerning who Christ is, which he will deliver to this woman as we see uh, this morning and in the coming weeks. And they come to a town of Samaria called Sychar, uh, which was where Jacob's well was at. We see that in verse 5 and 6. And we're told that this was near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. And the reference there was to uh, Genesis chapter 48, verse 22, where Jacob promises his son Joseph on his deathbed one mountain slope that he took from the Amorites with his sword and his bow. And Jacob's well was in this town. It's a well that is fed by an underground spring that is actually still reliable to this day. And Jesus, verse 6, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour about 12 p.m. It's about noon, midday. Now, we learn in verse 8 that his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So while he's sitting there alone, verse 7 tells us that a woman from Samaria comes to this well to draw water. Now, normally, women would come in groups to get water. And they would come either earlier or later in the day so they wouldn't come midday and, and face the, the fierce heat of the sun right there in midday. And we won't get to these verses until next week, but I just want to note that the reason that this woman comes alone is most likely because of her lifestyle. The reason that she comes alone midday is most likely because of the lifestyle that she lived. You can see in verse 18 that this woman has had five husbands in her life, and the man that she is currently living with is not her husband. So this is a woman who does not have a good background and who is currently living in an open, sinful lifestyle and is dishonoring the marriage bed as the man that she currently lives with at this very moment is not her husband. So this is a woman who is in rebellion to God, uh, and so it's very possible that her public shame may have con contributed to her coming by herself. Her coming by herself at midday, not being with the other women to avoid the people of the town. And instead of just lit, uh, sitting there, minding his own business and resting because he's tired, because he's weary, Jesus intentionally engages in a conversation with this woman. He doesn't just sit there. He intentionally speaks to her. He asks her for a drink. We see that at the end of verse 7. Jesus says to her, give me a drink. And I do understand that he asked her for a drink here. And I have no doubt that he's actually thirsty. But he is using this language as a segue to speak of what we will see him talking about in the living water that this woman truly needs in verse 10. Jesus is being intentional here. And seeing this, I'm glad that I got to preach on what I did last week, looking at the humility and the humanity of Christ. Because we understand here that he felt exhausted just like any, any one of us would. He's fully God. He's fully man. He felt everything that he felt 
just as any other man would or woman would, as any mankind would, as any human would feel this wearisome feeling traveling from Judea through Samaria to this town of Sakar. He's tired. He's worn out. This word weary means to labor with wearisome effort. It means, it means to toil. It means to become exhausted. And most people in this kind of situation are not thinking of evangelizing someone. Most people have sat down by this well. They're tired. They just want to sit there. They just want to rest. They're thinking about how tired they are. I think you know how it can get sometimes. You can, you can be so tired sometimes, you, you just don't feel like talking to anyone. You ever, anyone ever get that way? I've been that way. I'm just so tired. I just want to sit down. I don't feel like talking to anyone. I'll get my own drink of water. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. His, his mind is set on doing the will of the Father and accomplishing his work. Whether it's in season or out of season. Whether he feels like it or whether he doesn't, he doesn't allow his feelings to direct what he knows he needs to do. He allows truth to direct him. Regardless of how he feels, he allows the truth of God to direct him in everything that he does. It's the same as, as it should be with us as his followers. Jesus isn't making excuses for not bringing people to truth. He's not letting his feelings get in the way. He is fully focused on accomplishing the work of God. That's where his mind is set at all times. So he doesn't just sit there. He engages this woman. He is intentional. He doesn't wait for this woman to say something to him because, well, really, in all probability, in this culture, she wouldn't have said anything to him anyways. Jews and Samaritans didn't have anything to do with each other at all. And you can see that clearly from her response. In verse 9, after he asked for this drink, the Samaritan woman says to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John gives us the explanation in, in the parentheses for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And so to get a little bit of understanding of this, uh, I want to give a, a little bit of history for why this conflict exists between these two people groups. Because it's important information to understand really the whole picture here and, and really how culturally shocking it is that this Jew would speak to this Samaritan woman. After the kingdom of Israel had split in two, with Israel being the northern kingdom and Judah being the southern kingdom, King Omri established and named the new capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. He, he named it and established it as Samaria. That's in 1 Kings 16 and 24. And the name Samaria began to be used to speak of the surrounding district and sometimes the entire northern kingdom itself. Sometimes people would just say Samaria and they're talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. And when the Assyrians captured Samaria in 722-721 BC, they deported the majority of the people and brought foreigners into the land to settle there, who then intermarried with the surviving Israelites, bringing them to continue their false worship. You see that in 2 Kings chapter 17-18. And after the Babylonian exile was over, the Jews who were returning to their homeland viewed the Samaritans not only as the children of their political rebels, not only as the children of their enemies, but they viewed them also as basically racial half-breeds who had a perverted religion. That was how they viewed them. They were the children of the enemies, and they were racial half-breeds who had a perverted religion. Now, the Samaritans had actually developed their own religious understanding of God that was based purely on the Pentateuch. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible. They only, they only accepted the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they completely rejected the historical books of the Old Testament and the books of the prophets. From Joshua to Malachi, they rejected that as scripture, and they only based their understanding of God based on the book of Moses, which, understanding that, you know that would bring in some completely uh, strong differences there between these two people groups. And because of this, as John explained, Jews did not have dealings with Samaritans. They didn't use the same things with Samaritans. They didn't, they didn't intertwine with Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritan half-breeds with their false religion were seen as continually unclean people. Continually unclean. And it would defile you to share a water jar with a Samaritan. If you, if you were seen using a water jar of a Samaritan person, you were seen as unclean from the Jewish people. 
That's how much animosity there was towards these people from the Jews. Uh, in fact, if, if you want to turn to John 8 with me, I'll, I'll show you how bad this really is. In John 8, I'm going to read verse 47 to 48. In John 8, 47, Jesus is speaking to the Jews of his day. And he says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you're not of God. Jesus is telling the Jews of his day, I know you claim to be of God, but if you were, you would listen to me. And the reason you don't listen to me is because you're not of God. Verse 48, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? That was meant as a cut down. That, that was a low blow. To call someone a Samaritan was a very derogatory term in this day. Are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan? You are unclean. You're a Samaritan. We're, we don't want to listen to you. That's how, that, that's how much animosity there was between these two people groups. It was so bad that calling someone a Samaritan was meant as a, as a low blow, a derogatory term. It's the same as certain racial terms that people still get called today that are not taken very well. <coughs> So to understand that and to see Jesus openly and freely engaging this woman really brings a different level of understanding to this passage that you're not going to have without this historical context. This is a very culturally shocking thing that's going on here. Uh, I heard a preacher say that you could compare this saying, maybe this would, would kind of open up your eyes to uh, the, the shockingness of, of what's going on here. You could compare this scene here to the president of the KKK reaching out and seeking to share the gospel with an African-American woman. That would be culturally shocking. That's how shocking it is here. It, it would be like the president of the KKK, who is supposed to be a part of a group that absolutely hates African-Americans, reaching out to an African-American woman and sharing with her the truth of the gospel. That's how shocking this is. This is crossing cultural boundaries here. But church, Jesus isn't worried about cultural boundaries. Amen. Amen? Jesus isn't worried about what people think. He's not worried about the culture. Jesus doesn't allow the normal thought and presuppositions of his day to direct his behavior. He's worried about doing the will of his father. He's worried about giving this woman the truth. It doesn't matter to him what these other people think. He knows the truth of God. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of truth. And he will only do that which is true. Who cares what the culture says? Who cares what the culture thinks? The culture needs to be corrected. Where most Jews wouldn't have said a word to this woman because they were raised to hate this woman, Jesus intentionally engages her in conversation. Now, there's no doubt several times in his life as a Jew that Jesus has heard about the uncleanliness of Samaritan people and that they were good for nothing. But those are simply lies and false ideologies that Jesus will not succumb to, will not submit himself to. Why? Because he knows the truth that we're all made in the image of God. In all creation, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of what people group they're in, regardless of their skin color, are made in the image of God. And because of that, they are worthy of dignity and they are worthy of respect. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus understands that. Jesus understands. Looking back at John chapter 3, Jesus understands that whether you're a Nicodemus of the world, whether you're respectable, whether you're top of the social status, top of the social class, or a Samaritan woman here in John 4, an openly sinful person, a cultural outcast. Whether you're a Nicodemus or whether you're a Samaritan woman, he understands that you're lost and you're both equally in need of a Savior. Regardless of where you are in the culture, you're both equally lost and you're in need of a Savior. Because even though we're made in the image of God, we are distorted images of God who have distorted that image by our sin and who desperately need to be saved and transformed by the power that only comes from Christ. See, Jesus doesn't have any conditions on to who he evangelizes because he's already met all the conditions for salvation himself. Salvation is found in him, him alone. You don't have to be a respectable white person to come to Christ. You don't have, you don't have to have two dogs and, and two kids and a nice brick home to come to Christ. You can be out on the street. You can be a homeless person. You can be CEO. It doesn't matter. You need to come to Christ because you rebelled against God and there is salvation in no one else. Amen. 
Christ Jesus alone. You just need to be a sinner in need of a Savior, which we all are. The true light doesn't just shine his light on certain people, groups, and statuses. The true light sheds his light on everyone, all peoples. We saw that in John 1, 9 in the prologue. That's why we are all one in the church. That's why there aren't any cliques in the church, or that's why there shouldn't be cliques in the church anyway. Because we're all equally in need of salvation. We're all equally sinners before a holy God. And no one is better than anyone else. Anything that we do by the grace of God is by his grace. And not because we're more worthy than anyone else. We're all equally sinners that need to be saved by a holy God. And we are all as the human race so dead in our sin. That it takes a miracle from heaven in the new birth to bring us to faith in Christ. We must be born again in order to see Jesus rightly. As John told us and in the prologue again in chapter 1, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, but the world didn't know him. He was in the world. The creator of the world came into his own creation. The world was made through him, but the world didn't know him. That's how dead in sin humans really are. The creator of the world can come into his own creation. We don't even pay him attention. We don't even know who he is. That's how blind we are. God can come down and we're so caught up in our own sin that we don't even recognize. God in the flesh asked this woman for a drink, and she's taken by surprise because of a cultivated racial tension. She's merely seeing him as a wearied Jewish traveler, not as the glorious son of God that he is. That truth must be revealed. We can't find that truth on our own. We must be born again. That, that truth must be revealed to us. And Jesus turns this question about physical water into a spiritual reality. He turns the physical into the spiritual in verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, if, if you knew who I really was, who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you really knew who I was, if you really knew the gift of God, you would have asked me and I would give you living water. And in this statement, Jesus is directly referencing uh, several Old Testament scriptures here. Several Old Testament scriptures that speak of living water that only comes from God. And the scriptures that he's referencing are actually ones from the books of the prophets that this woman as a Samaritan wouldn't even agree with that is scripture. That she wouldn't even be raised up to see as scripture because they came from the prophet books. But church, just because someone doesn't believe that what you're quoting to them is the true word of God, that doesn't mean that you don't need to speak it. Amen? They need to hear the truth. It doesn't matter whether they believe it's true or not. They need to hear it. That they would be saved by the power of God through his word. Just because someone doesn't believe that what you're quoting to them is the true word of God, that doesn't mean that you don't need to speak it. It's through the word of truth that God brings forth his people. It's through, it's through the word that he saves. Church, uh, if, if someone breaks into your house and says they don't believe in guns, are you going to leave it on the dresser? No, you're, you're going to shoot or you're at least going to point that thing. It doesn't matter whether you believe in guns or not. I got one. You need to get out of my house. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or whether you believe this is his word or not. It is. It's true. And I need to give that to you. I need to give you the word of truth. Because it's through that word of truth that God saves his people. The power of salvation is in the gospel. We must take this sharp sword out and let God do his work. Regardless of what people think about it. Speak the truth and let the spirit of God work. Jeremiah 2.13. In Jeremiah 2.13, the Lord God says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've forsaken me, the, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out or cut out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The people of Israel at that time, and really the human race as a whole, forsake their creator's fresh running supply of goodness. Fresh, running supply. And they do this in order to seek out the mess that comes from this world. The mess that comes from the imaginations of men. True refreshment, church. True satisfaction only comes from our Creator. It does not come from the creation. True satisfaction, true joy, true contentment, true refreshment only comes from our Creator and not this creation. Naturally, we would all rather dig out broken cisterns, broken tanks that won't hold a thing when there's a full eternal supply of goodness and satisfaction that comes from our God. A full, abundant, eternal supply that comes from our Lord. Praise God for His grace. Amen? Amen.
Praise God for him coming to us because naturally in our sin, we'd still be too busy trying to find some other way that would never work. We'd still be too busy trying to dig out a broken cistern that won't hold a thing. But God gives his living water freely. God's living water froze flows freely from his grace. He says uh, again in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. All you have to do is ask for this living water. You don't have to do anything to earn this living water because there's nothing you can do to earn it. He gives it freely by his grace. All you have to do is ask. Repent. Turn. Quit trusting in yourself and your so-called goodness that isn't good at all and trust in the perfect righteousness of Christ and you will be given living water. Flows freely. Prophet Zechariah spoke of a day when living waters would flow out of Jerusalem. Zechariah 14.8. And fulfilled in Christ, he's not talking about the physical city there. He's talking about the new Jerusalem from above that, that comes down from our God that all who are in Christ are a part of. Beloved, for the true church, for all those who are in Christ, those living waters are flowing. Those living waters are flowing out of Jerusalem, out of the people of God. We've been washed, we've been cleansed by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus. And this woman, again, again, is still thinking in the physical here. She's still thinking in the physical. She's not, she's not understanding what, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking about living water. Verse 11 to 12. The woman said to him, Sir... You have nothing to draw water with. Basically, you don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep. Where are you getting this living water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well. He drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. How are you going to get this stuff that you're talking to me about? She's still thinking in the physical, not understanding the truth that he's bringing to her. Shouldn't have a clue what he's saying. And church, that's okay. Every one of us will go through that as we seek to bring people the gospel. You ever had someone misunderstand you as you seek to bring someone the truth of Christ? That's going to happen. Beloved, the things of God are folly to the natural man. There's going to be misunderstandings. We should expect misunderstanding. Misunderstandings are going to happen. People will misunderstand us, and we will have to clarify things and re-say things and clarify things again. The things of God are folly to the natural man. When we're trying to relay spiritual things to someone that is purely caught up in the natural world, purely caught up in the physical world, there's going to be complications. I'm trying to give someone spiritual truths who's only caught up in the physical, who's only caught up in the natural, who's dead in their trespasses, who doesn't understand a thing about God. It's totally separated from God. They're in the flesh, and their flesh can only produce flesh. It can't produce the spiritual of what we learn from Jesus in John 3. So there's going to be misunderstandings there. We're going to re-say things. We're going to have to repeat ourselves. We're going to have to clarify things. But we need to understand that. We need to understand that there are going to be misunderstandings. We need to understand that naturally they're not going to get it. Because if we don't understand that, we'll start getting frustrated, wondering why they don't get it. I just don't understand why they don't understand what I'm saying. Well, they're in the flesh, and unless they be born again, they're never going to get it. Unless the Spirit of God does a, a miracle in their heart, to raise them from death to life, they're never going to get it. They're never going to understand it. If the Spirit of God doesn't move upon them, they will forever never understand it. But we need to make sure on our part that we're seeking to be as clear as we can. 2 Timothy 2, 24-26 The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. In the divine plan of things, it's upon the sovereignty of God, whether he chooses to show mercy to someone and grant them repentance, grant them the new birth, that they may see the wickedness of their sin and the glories of the Savior of Christ. And deliver them to the truth. But we must... Deliver them the truth in order that he would do that. God doesn't save anyone apart from them hearing the truth. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. Amen. Romans 10, 17, James 1, 18, of his own will, of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. It's upon us to deliver them the truth 
which is the means that he does that through. It's the means by which he grants repentance and grants the new birth for them to come to the truth. A woman says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And that, that may seem like a dumb question, but not from someone who doesn't understand spiritual things at all. She just doesn't get it. She needs a new birth from above. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Well, of course he's greater than Jacob. Amen? Of course he's greater than Jacob. He's greater than everyone. He, he who comes from above is above all. Of course he is. And Jesus, following what we just read in 2 Timothy 2, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Jesus just makes it so plain here. We conclude our passage for this morning. She's in the physical. He just restates it and makes it very clear, very plain here. Jesus says to her, verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water, this physical water right here, this well, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. You drink of this water, you're going to have to get another drink. Thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And in the Greek, it literally says, you'll never be thirsty forever. There'll never be a time where you'll be thirsty again. I will fill you up, he says. Whoever drinks of this water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become him a spring of water, welling up, rising up to eternal life. He just lays it out and he makes it plain. You drink of this water, you're going to be thirsty again. You drink of the water that I will give you, True spiritual water, it will eternally refresh you. It will eternally satisfy you. It will give you everything that you are looking for. If you continue to have your mind set on this water quenching your thirst, you'll have to come back day after day after day after day. But if you understand that the water I give eternally fulfills, you'll never have to go anywhere else. You'll never have to go anywhere else. The water from this well satisfies but for a time. But the water that I give satisfies forever, eternally. You'll never have to go anywhere else. It becomes a, a spring of water rising up to eternal life. Church, are we trying to find fulfillment, refreshment, satisfaction in, in relationships, organizations, occupations, money, fornication, social media, drugs, alcohol, social status, etc., etc., etc.? et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. If we do that, we're never going to be truly satisfied. We're always going to have to want more. I need to get higher up on the food chain. I, I need more likes on my Facebook status. Uh, do they really like me? I, I think I need someone who likes me a little bit more. I, I just don't feel it. If we're always basing everything that we do on the creation, our satisfaction, our refreshment, our joy, we're basing it on things that will never truly fulfill. We're basing it on things that will never truly satisfy the way our creator satisfies. You're just going to have to keep going back, keep going back and going back. You keep trying to find true satisfaction and refreshment in earthly things, you're going to be thirsty again. You come to Christ, you'll never be thirsty again. You'll never be thirsty again. You can learn, as Paul says in Philippians 4, you can learn how to be content no matter the circumstance. You can abound, you can have a lot, you can be abased, you can be brought low and have nothing. But you're content, not because of what you have or who does or doesn't like you, but because you have Christ, which is the greatest treasure you can ever have in this world. You will find in Christ all that you ever need. And this water doesn't sit stagnant in a person. This water keeps moving. It wells up. It rises up to eternal life. If you've truly drank of this water, it grows in you as you become more and more conformed into his image and grow more and more to love Christ for who he is. Our Lord Jesus says in John 7, verse 37 to 38, actually it says there, he cries out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. If you thirst, come to me. You will be eternally fulfilled, the Lord Jesus Christ says. Come to me. I'll give you rest. I will fulfill you. I will satisfy you in a way that nothing in this world has ever satisfied you. I will fulfill your soul. Rivers of living water. This is what happens to those who are in Christ. They're forever changed by him. Forever changed by him. These waters don't quit flowing, church. If you've come to Christ, you have rivers of living water, and they continue to flow and continue to flow. They don't stop flowing because they didn't start from us. They started from him who gave them. He is 
eternal satisfaction. He is the presence of joy himself. This is what this woman needed to hear, church. This is what every single person on this earth needs to hear. Every single person. Let me ask you, have you drank of this water? Amen? Amen. Have you drank of this water? Amen. If you have, you must understand that this water is too good to keep to yourself. This water is too good to just keep to ourselves. This water needs to be given to all creation. I understand some of us may not feel like we know everything that we need to know in sharing the gospel. Well, you can welcome to the club. Welcome yourself to the club of not knowing everything that needs to be known. I, I as a pastor, do not know everything that there is that needs to be known. But I know that everything that needs to be known comes from here. And I can share that. I can share the gospel. I can share your great need to come to Christ and his eternal fulfillment that will come to you. His righteousness, his satisfaction, his justification, his forgiveness that comes only in Christ. That he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. That the Father has given all things to the Son. And if you come to him, you will find everything that you will ever need. You embrace your creator, your Lord, your master. Embrace him as Savior. I can share that. You may not be able to answer every question. That's fine. You can answer those later. You can answer those later. There's still time. Do you know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Do we know that? Has, has, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is holy and just. And there's nothing that we can do on our own to be made right with him. It must come from the perfect righteous life of Christ. Who has lived it for our sake. <laughs> To be on our behalf, to be credited to our account for our righteousness. Amen? Amen? God is holy and just. Do we know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who lived a life that we could never live? Died the death that we all deserve. We deserve the wrath and justice of God because of our rebellion against Him. Do we know that? Amen? Amen. Do we know that He was raised on the third day? Do we know that salvation is in Him and Him alone? Amen? Amen? Amen. Do we know that it is in Christ where someone finds all that they need and they must repent, they must turn and entrust themselves to the Savior. They must turn from, from trusting their self and their own goodness and their own so-called righteousness and trusting the perfect righteousness of Christ. Do we know that? Amen. Amen. Now you can share the gospel. You can share the gospel. You can share and you can trust the Spirit of God to do His work to apply those truths to their heart. To their dead heart that may not understand them at first. But by a miracle of the new birth, they can. And if you've never done it before, if you've never shared the gospel before, then you, as a professing believer in Christ, need to repent. Amen. Because that's what we've been called to do. Not just pastors and Sunday school teachers and, and so forth and so forth. All of us, we've all been called to share the gospel. And we just need to simply understand that we're never going to get good or comfortable in anything without just getting out there and doing it. That's one of the similar things to everything else in this world. We're not going to get good or comfortable at doing something if we don't ever get out there and do it. If we don't ever just get out there and intentionally engage someone with the gospel. And this doesn't take away from doing it, but you can definitely find a good gospel track and hand it to someone. Find a good gospel track that has the gospel message on it and hand it to someone. Invite someone to church where, where they will hear the gospel. This is something that all Christians should be doing. From the great example of our Lord, we see that we need to do this regardless of how we feel. Right? We see a wearisome Lord. He's been traveling. He's wearisome. He's tired. He's worn out. But we need to do it whether we're wearisome or not. We need to do it in season and out of season, whether we feel like it or whether we don't. Regardless of how we feel. It doesn't matter who the person is. They need the gospel just as much as anyone else does. It doesn't matter what the culture says about someone. They need the gospel. It doesn't matter how I've been raised to feel about a certain uh, ethnicity or skin color. They need the gospel. They've been made in the image of God. I need to treat them with respect and dignity and give them the truth. I need to show them love and try to bring them to Christ. And I need to expect misunderstandings. I need to expect misunderstandings. But I can just keep bringing back people to the truth. Keep bringing them back to the truth. We see that in our Lord. And we'll continue to see it as we make our way through this passage. 
She's thinking in the physical. He keeps bringing her back to the truth. Just keep bringing her back to the truth and trust the Spirit of God to do His work. We on our own cannot convert someone. It's the Spirit of God that does that. Trust the Spirit of God. And we must be intentional. Church, there, there may be someone that you're thinking of right now that you know you need to share the truth with. Well, quit waiting on them to ask you because they probably never will. Don't wait too long. Engage them. Intentionally engage them. Share the truth with them. Hey, do you know the gospel? Hey, do you know why I go to church? Do you know why Jesus Christ is so important? I'd like to share that with you. I'd like to share with you the truth of Christ. I'd like to share with you the truth of, of why I go to church every Sunday, every Lord's Day to worship with my family. Tell them how they can never be thirsty again. Because they'll never believe if they're not told. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. Praise God for Christ. Praise God for our great Savior and the great example that he gives us here. The great example that he gives us here who, who is weary and is culturally raised up to hate such a woman, to think that she's continually unclean. He's like, I'm throwing all that off and my mind is set on truth. Feelings aren't directing me. Truth is. We walk by faith and not by sight, not by feelings. Praise God for our, our perfect example in Christ of what it looks like to perfectly live to the glory of God. And may the hearts of the saints be encouraged this morning. May the hearts of the saints be built up. May our minds be set upon the truth of who our God is and the truth of how we should intentionally engage people with the truth of who he is. May our hearts be stirred up to share with people the true light that shines on the darkness. And the hearts of the saints be encouraged and may our God and Savior be glorified both here in the church and all over this globe, both now and forevermore. Praise God for his word. If you would bow with me. Lord God, I'm so thankful for this passage this morning. I'm so thankful uh, for what we see in it. I'm so thankful for continuing to see John lay out the intentions of his gospel and simply seeing how great you are, Lord Jesus. Fully God and fully man. And you are worthy of all of our affections. You are worthy of all of our desires. You are worthy of all of our aspirations. You are the utmost. And you deserve our utmost. God, I'm so thankful for the privilege to know Christ. I'm so thankful for the new birth. You have raised me from death to life because of your grace and to the glory of it. So thankful for your word. Lord, I pray that we would have a greater confidence in your word this morning, that we would continue to have a great confidence in your word, and, and because of that confidence, we would continue to study it, that we may deliver your truth to a lost and dying world. Lord, let us have a confidence in the power that it has, that your gospel is the power to salvation, Romans 1. Lord, may the hearts of your saints be built up this morning. Lord, I pray that my imperfections as, as a man, as part of this human race as well, do not get in the way of your perfect word going forth and building up your sheep. May we be encouraged and built up and see you for who you truly are. And may we share that that more and more and more people would come into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.